How do I start a mix the right way? How much signal do I send into my plugins to make sure that I'm hitting the sweet spot? And finally, how do I push up a rough mix that doesn't send me on a wild goose chase for the entire mixing process? I see these questions a ton in forums and Facebook groups. And let me tell you, there's some good answers, but there's some really bad answers too. So I wanted to address that today. I'm going to show you how to do all of that and more coming up in just a second. Welcome back to the Mix Academy. I'm David Glenn with davidglennrecording.com and themixacademy.com. Today, we've got a sweet tutorial. We're gonna talk gain staging, but before we dive in, I wanna share, I'm making these multi-tracks that you're gonna hear in a second available for free. You'll be able to download these, mix it for yourself, and yes, you can use it on your resume. All rights have been cleared. You just gotta give the artist credit. I have all that information down in the description below. And I've also thrown in some free mix videos. You can download them or stream them straight to your favorite device. All of that linked in the description below. Tons of free stuff there. Go check it out. Let's move on. Let's talk about gain staging. All right, let's look at that first question first. How to start a mix the right way. Now, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that my way is the way. It's the only way. Absolutely not. There are plenty of ways that you could gain stage differently than what I'm going to show you here and find success. But there are lots of bad ways to do it. And I want to try to help simplify this for you. And I get great results. So I figured this would help a lot of people to kind of say, hey, Here's how I do it. Go give it a shot for yourself and see how it works for you. Uh, basically, we get recording sent to us as mixers, or if you're a producer or a hobbyist and you're in the studio recording your own stuff, you're going to have tracks that are recorded at one level over here. Maybe the drums are super low and they're recorded conservative, and then you get the guitars, send them off, and the guy sends them back to you super hot. Maybe the bass comes to you and it's somewhere in between. The vocals, you get the point. Tracks are coming to you all different levels. And our job, part of our job as mixers is to create a nice balance. Well, if you've got tracks all over the place and you just import them into your DAW and you start trying to work with the faders to create your rough mix, chances are it's going to look like a, one of those old school wooden roller coasters. They're going to be all over the place. You're going to have to have faders up at plus six, plus 12, whatever. And then some are going to be at minus 20 to try to create a good balance where we're going to get the best performance out of our faders, especially when we get to automation. If we can get a nice consistent gain structure across the board and then build a rough mix around that. So when we're talking gain staging, the first thing that comes to my mind as a mixer is balances. The second would be uh, headroom, I guess not in any particular order, but we'll look at that when we talk about the plug-in sweet spot, right? So how do we achieve that? How do we give ourselves a nice starting place? Well, let's look at what the norm typically is when a producer or a band sends you files. Here I've got uh, just a few tracks I've imported in for, for example's sake. And uh, you can see here the kick up top is really low. The, the thump kick is even lower. The hat is pretty hot. The bass DI. You can see there's varying levels here. If I hit play, just everything at zero. Yeah, okay, so now to build a rough mix with that, I'll flip over to the uh, the mixer window and never use it, but we'll use it for this. If I wanna get a rough mix and I just leave it like that, get that kick up. Gotta push that, I still don't have enough room for this. I'll probably turn that hat down. Get that bass up. Guitars are too hot, we'll pull them back. Okay, now we can hear the drums a little bit. Those tellies. Strings are way too hot. Okay, now remember we talked about the wooden roller coaster, right? So, woo, got a nice uh, roller coaster kind of graphical image there to, uh, to prove the point. Now, there's a better way. Here's the better way. You could go track by track. This is the free version, the free way, would be to go to your DAW's trim plugin or your gain plugin. And in Pro Tools, we have, I always get this wrong, it's multi mono, I believe. Other trim, there we go. I use a different, uh, I use an app. We're gonna talk about that in a second. But the free way, for those of you guys not looking to spend anything and accomplish the uh, the point here, we can come into the trim plugin and let's see where this kick drum is hitting. Okay, if we zoom in on that, it's not even hitting at the peak at minus 24. I want that to be a little hotter. That's too much headroom for my taste. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come to clip gain I'm gonna boost that up. You can sit here and just drag that up until you want to get, I, personally, I prefer the peak at minus 18, uh, but you could go as hot as minus 10. Just don't go over minus six. You'll get yourself into some serious trouble. So you increase that until we get to around 
minus 18 peak. So we've got that, that's a little bit, little bit closer. We'll basically throw that trim plug in on every single track and you could go manually with clip gain or whatever your DAW has as a feature similar to clip gain and you can set your tracks to around minus 18. Like I said, there's a much better way. If you do this professionally, don't waste your time. My man Blake Eisman has an app called Stereo Monoizer. He's got a company called Soundizers and uh, in a nutshell, the intent of this app is to convert those uh, stereo files you get that are not true stereo. They're big mono, just the same information on the left and right. You Logic guys, producers, driving us Pro Tools mixers crazy with those. Stereo Monoizer will collapse those stereo files. It'll convert it to just be a single mono audio file. Save CPU uh, processing power, I, I believe, yeah, a little bit, and then um, hard drive space for sure. Another feature built into this app is the Normalize Gain 2 feature. Now, this is peak-based normalization. If you've heard of normalization, like the way I grew up thinking of it was the Audio Suite plugin in Pro Tools, um, very different when you have normalization and, and you're dealing with RMS versus peak. This is peak-based normalization. It's not going to affect the RMS or the uh, uh, compressor and expand or do any kind of junk to your file. This is going to simply raise or lower the overall volume or gain structure of your file to whatever you set this to. For me personally, I go to minus 18 dBFS peak. That's pretty conservative. You can go as hot as like minus 10 dBFS peak. Very important to think peak here. But you don't want to go over minus 6. Uh, you're going to get yourself into a lot of trouble and cause distortion and artifacts that you don't want. So uh, I start at minus 18 dBFS peak. You drag the audio folder that you're dealing with here. You get client files. In this case, we have 101. Don't forget, you can download them for free. I've got the drums and the music broken out, the vocals in a separate folder. You would just take this, you drop it in there, drop it, making up words now. You drop the folder into the app, and then you set that normalized gain. You're going to analyze first. I'm not going to do it because it's already been done, but you're going to analyze the files. It's going to look at what's true stereo, what's mono. It's going to convert the, the stereo files that are not true stereo into mono. And then when you process, it's also going to normalize gain to whatever you set it here, minus 18 dBFS peak. Now for me, a little reason why I do minus 18 peak is because I do a lot of parallel processing. Uh, I parallel process the kick, the snare a lot of times. And then I also parallel them as a whole, the shells of the kit. Uh, and then I do different things that kind of build the <laughs> the loudness of the, uh, of the song up. Uh, if you are one of those mixers that has perfect gain sca scaling, gain staging, and when you put a plug in on, you're perfect with your bringing your output back and bypassing and checking. I don't have time for all that. I do a pretty good job. But uh, then you may want to go a little hotter, maybe minus 10. Uh, if you don't do a lot of parallel processing, maybe minus 10 is better for you. So uh, try it out this way. See what works for you. And then depending upon your template and how you have your buses and your routing and all that stuff set up, you may like it my way. You may like it a little bit different. Some of you may like it even lower. But minus 18 dBFS peak, enough said about that. There's two ways to do it. Um, there's a couple other plugins out there. Uh, Defaulter is one I used to use. Actually, I want to give a shout out to Sarah Carter, an engineer who uh, was a student of mine in the Mix Academy. And she reached out and was like, hey, Dave, I, I see normalized gain. Uh, is that similar to Defaulter? And I hit up Blake, the developer of Stereo Monoizer. He was like, yeah, absolutely. That's peak-based normalization. Changed my life super quick. Uh, or my assistant's life because he no longer had to sit here with Defaulter and hit analyze for every single track but there is a plugin called defaulter i still use this but not for mix prep i use it for when uh one section of background vocals is super quiet compared to another and we'll go through and we'll, we'll kind of balance out sometimes in the mix but we'll save that for another video defaulter is another option although it is only pro tools uh, it's pro tools only okay so we've had a mouthful up to this point i hope you understand that better so now everything is imported to minus 18 dbfs peak let me come over here i've got a playlist where it is set the way that i like it but this is not an end-all be-all solution minus 18 dbfs peak for a kick drum is going to be very different than for stacks of guitars if you got stacks of vocals the increase in volume the increase in gain with those doubles or triples or layers your kick drum is not going to be able to compete with that so there's going to be some work on the back end once you import the files but i'm going to show you how i do that now all right, so we've got the tracks imported to minus 18 dBFS peak. What's the next step? The next step for me is I like to uh, set up my routing. 
Okay, so I'm going to send my drums to my all drums bus, all that good stuff. We can learn more about that in another video. Uh, but once I get my routing set up, I like to come over and select the tracks, group them, and I create a, uh, a quick group called down. Down is simply going to be so I can drag all the faders to minus 20. Okay, some people like to use their clip gain to build the rough mix. I like to have a nice consistent starting place for all the gain structure, and then I like to use the faders to build the rough mix, and uh, that's just the way that I like to do it. We're going to show that here. Once everything's down to minus 20, I'll turn the group off so I can uh, treat these tracks independently, so I can move each fader independently again. First step for me is I like to go to the kick, the main kick. I snap it up to zero. Look here. It looks like the main clap or snare is down here. I like to pull the kick, the snare, the bass, and the vocal all the way up to zero. Just kind of snap them up to zero. It should be a decent starting place for those main elements. And then I like to build it like a house. I like that to serve as the foundation for the levels and then build the other things up underneath it. Some will push up and, and change the gain structure with clip gain, sometimes with plugins. Uh, the sweet spot's a little different than where that minus 18 peak is uh, set initially. So we do a little bit of gain scaling there where we pull the input back or, full or, or up and the output back. We'll get to that. But for simplistic sake here, I'm going to snap the fader of my kick, my snare, my bass, and my vocal. Uh, I didn't import a vocal. I'm going to import a vocal. All right, so I actually imported the gang vocals, the background vocals, uh, and the lead vocal bus. When you download these files for free, the link in the description, you're going to get all the stacks. So you'll get every single one. You'll be able to control the blend yourself. Uh, but there's also the bus print from the recording engineer. So that was kind of cool. All right, so now where are we at? We've got uh, the faders were down at zero. We snapped our kick, our main clap, our bass, and now our vocals to zero on the fader. That's gonna kind of serve as the ceiling for where I want things to, to be built. But like I said, this is not a perfect world where minus 18 just solves all your rough mix problems. You still have to mix, right? And you're gonna see that in transient driven um, instruments, it, attack on the drums, the kick, the snare, the um, percussion tracks, where there's not a lot of RMS there or sustain, um, you're going to, um, and especially actually with mono to stereo tracks, you're going to see that you're going to need to do a little bit of legwork to get them to work out. This kick here, um, I actually converted it to a mono because that's what I prefer. I want that bottom end to be right down the middle. If I want room or stereo sound, then I'll send it to a verb or something. But um, we've got a mono kick. We have our clap that is stereo. So there's already a difference there with minus 18 stereo and mono. And then we have um, the vocals that are at minus 18 peak. One last point about minus 18 peak. Again, this is not a perfect situation, but it's a great starting place. And once you understand the basic concepts, you're going to be able to go and do this for yourself. Um, peak means the highest peak is set to minus 18. That doesn't mean that the average, this stuff is not minus 18. So for this vocal, I may take some time, and I do this uh, often, either myself or my assistant, we will break out the verse, the pre-chorus, the bridge, the different vocal parts into different tracks, and then sometimes treat them with the same bus processing and parallel compression, sometimes uh, independent of each other so that we can get a unique sound between parts or sections. Uh, in this case, that's something I would do, so it's not going to be the best example as far as the lead vocal is concerned, but again pretty straightforward as far as the rest of it and I just want to kind of demo it so everything's imported everything's at minus 18 peak now we've got the faders drop down to minus 20 and then the core elements the kick snare bass and vocal are snapped to zero and we're going to build it like a house and uh, let this kind of serve as the foundation to kind of pull everything else in but the kick is not going to be loud enough let me hit play and let's take a listen to what we've got now So that kick and the sustain and the verb that, or excuse me, the snap, the clap, the sustain and the clap is louder than the attack of the kick. We want to create a little bit better balance. I'm not going to do that with the fader. I want that to stay at zero, but I am going to go to clip gain and make a couple of minor adjustments. Now, because I've got multiple kicks, I'm gonna keep that in mind. There's things to learn here. It's not just, hey, it's as simple as one, two, three, and you're mixing a record, but uh, snap pulling that up, what, six, seven dB is going to, uh, I'm gonna be a little happier with that as a starting place. Let's see this clap. Hey, we're cool with a clap. Let's get this bass. I 
Here's a good example. The bass is not very loud, right? We have to pull that up already. It's almost 10 dB. If we look here, there are some sharp transients in this bass recording. It could have been uh, digging into the strings. It could have been a compressor artifact. Someone could have stepped on a cable. All kinds of stuff goes down in recording that we're not there to see as mixers. In this case, we've got a sharp transient here. Nice little transient there popping through. So whether it's that one or some other transient, maybe this one, that, that really quick blast of energy is what's set to minus 18 peak. So again, this is not a perfect system, but it's going to be a great starting place. And if you understand that this is not averaged at minus 18 peak, it is, that's kind of a contradiction there, but it, the, there's going to be blasts. There's going to be things that you need to account for. And this is a great example of doing a little extra legwork. Sometimes you'll import these in man, rock and roll. It'll be great. It'll be smooth. You won't have to do a bunch of extra work, but in this case we do. So let's listen to that again. And now I feel like that bass transient, which we're going to compress when we mix this, uh, and that kick are a little closer. They're at least closer than they were without any clip gain done to them. So now those, the vocal, and the background vocals are all okay and remember i said i would break out the vocal from the uh, from the verse i would treat the verse a little bit differently let's just ignore this section here for this tutorial's sake let's say we're just dealing with this And I'll pull that fader up. Look, again, it's another, what, 6 dB? I'm blind without my glasses. 6 dB up, and that's just a rough level. Now that I have my core, kick, snare, bass, and vocal sitting where I want it, and the fader's at zero, now I'm comfortable to go in, and I don't ever use a mix window, but we're going to do it for so visual sake. Now we can go in and kind of build underneath that. Some thump in the kick. Another clap sound. We'll just kind of pull these up here. Okay. And we got a couple tellies. What are these? There's a sound right there that may have like an artifact or something preventing it from uh, from standing out. So we'll go pull that, this guy right here. So I'll put the fader back at zero, increase the gain. I'm gonna listen for those high points there, the peak, so that I don't increase the average and then I've got this peak coming on. I'd probably clip gain that down, maybe do a little bit of uh, editing to, uh, to tighten up the balance compression. Just depends on what you want to do, what what you're going for tonally. But uh, okay, so we've got that guy up, and I probably will have that around zero. So now you can look most of the faders for what we've brought in. That's not a, a track that's in. They're going to be closer to zero, not exactly at zero, but they're all going to be kind of up and around there. That's going to be important for when we get to automation. Uh, my understanding, not an audio scientist by any means, but uh, my understanding is that you get a higher fidelity. You get a uh, a lot more um, feel and play from the faders when they're up around zero than if you were automating and you're down here and you're like making fine adjustments, you're gonna have a, an easier time doing that when they're up around zero. Okay, so now let's get those strings in here. Okay. Now we got some other stuff in. We'll probably go and treat that vocal a little differently. Remember this stuff out here, the peaks, I would have that on a separate track. Just kind of pay attention to those first two uh, phrases here. Let's check this out. Okay, so now we got our vocal, we got our kick, snare, bass. We kind of built a little rough mix here. And I'm happier with that. And I feel like that's a way easier way than just importing the tracks as they were provided to you. You have no idea what's hot, what's not. You're messing with all of it. At least that minus 18 peak is gonna put them in the same ballpark and then you can make finer adjustments from there. Now this is a, uh, uh, a 
I don't want to put a percentage on it, but I get sessions like this a lot, but I also get it to where it works out a lot smoother than what we've seen here. Uh, and this is recorded pretty darn well. All right, now that we've covered how to establish a solid rough mix with good game structure, I want to talk a little bit about the importance of a template and how whether you choose to follow my lead and go with minus 18 peak or you go minus 10, whatever, your template and your gain staging between your tracks, your buses, your parallel buses, all of that, uh, the template's gonna be huge in helping you maintain that similar or same game structure from mix to mix to mix, be it within a project or from one artist to another. It's huge to uh, to pick a number and go with it. If it's minus 18, if it's minus five, or excuse me, minus 18, if it's minus 10, just don't go above minus 10, I don't recommend that. Uh, and if you're like me and you like to push things and uh, do a lot of parallel, uh, a conservative number will be better for you. So uh, that being said, gain staging, the importance of a template, not only will you have your effects and your routing, but you'll also be able to um, build a consistency with your workflow and your gain staging. All right, so now let's talk about gain staging within the world of audio plugins. Uh, the myth of the sweet spot. Is it a myth? Is it true? It's actually true, but is it something you should worry too much about? Eh, kind of. It depends. So I'm going to use a couple of examples. We're going to breeze through this. Uh, the first one I want to show you is Slate's Trigger 2. Uh, if you're replacing drums, if you're blending drums, kind of the industry standard it is the industry standard. You used to have programs. Some of you guys may still use Drumagog or whatever, but uh, Slate blows them all the way in, in today's times. So that's what we're going to work with here. If you start at minus 18 peak, you will have to adjust the gain if you slap Slate's trigger on. In the manual for Slate's trigger 2, uh, it describes that you want to increase the input until your hardest hitting uh, kicks, snares, whatever, are um, uh, reading across the top here of this graphical window. So if we hit play on a kick drum, you'll see the kicks are consistently nowhere near the top. We want them to land up here. So you could do it a couple of ways. You could use clip gain, or you could take this volume knob and uh, the input gain, input section here, and you can just increase the signal until the highest or hardest hitting kick in your session is hitting across the top. Now, what you don't want to do is just crank it to where everything is above that, and it's just all one hit. You may want to do that uh, for uh, you know, a pop song or a rock song where you want a consistent hit, but there's a better way to do it than to just crank the input. We want to set that input to where, let's find actually a couple kick drums here that vary. These don't vary too much. It's a programmed kick, uh, programmed drums on this one, but a live kick you're definitely going to want to uh, at least use this as your starting place. You may not want to, um, you may not want your sample to react softer, louder, more dynamics. You may want to close that gap, but we'll do that in the curves. And I talk about that a ton in my course, Mixing Drums. We're not going to cover that here. But to get the gain staging part of trigger uh, set up correctly, we want to make sure that the loudest hits go right across the top of this window here. So we're going to set that back to zero. And let's increase the gain until the louder hits are up there towards the top. You know, let's go ahead and pull in a sample because I want to show you guys the... I've got a gospel sample here that will serve awesome for this. Let me make sure that's the right one. It is. So for this one, we got a sample now. Let's put that back here. You'll hear nothing's going to happen. The detail knob's not, not enough signal, right? Let's increase it. Now this is a one shot. So even with a one shot, Trigger will adjust the volume to imitate dynamics. I'm going to get that to where that hit, the transient, goes right across the top. Okay, so we're we're in the ballpark there. So you got some that are going across the top, some that are a little lower. Um, I'm not going to show you how to use Trigger here, but you can drop that detail knob in most cases pretty far down, especially if you have a live drummer. You may have some really soft, you know, dun, 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 a build crescendo, and you're going to want to make sure those are accounted for. So that detail knob, the lower you drop it, the more it's going to uh, pick up those softer hits. Uh, you may have to do some clip gain or whatever to adjust for that again. Go check out mixingdrums.com. Uh, Retrigger here. If you do drop the detail knob, you're going to want to boost that just a little bit. If you're working in metal and you've got a bunch of kick blasts and you know um, tight 
fills, 16th notes, 32nd notes, whatever, any kind of insane uh, flams or anything like that with double kicks, you'll want to watch the re-trigger. But you can, in most genres, safely boost that up to prevent any kind of double hits or triggers from the recording. So enough about how to use trigger. I want to tell you about the gain staging. So you're going to pull that input up, and then let's check the, the volume. If we pulled that kick in, we bypass it. Can pull the blend knob. Okay, so I may want to back off the output a little bit. And that's pretty similar, and you can get really picky with this. I, I tend to just kind of go with it, move on. I don't spend a whole lot of time. I used to, especially if you're learning, and you want to hear the difference between things like compression, what's EQ doing, you can be fooled by louder is better, right? And so you want to make sure you do a good job gain scaling, pulling back the output and comparing. Uh, for me, I, I do it quickly, just kind of move on. But uh, definitely as you're starting out, you want to make sure you do a really good job and be super um, OCD when it comes to your gain scaling there. So so trigger, did we show trigger enough? Uh, we've got the, the level, it's coming in. It's at the right spot according to the manual. We bypass it. We've got a similar sound. The, the kick drum is very different. We got a lot more bottom end and whatnot in the sample. But uh, at least now, trigger is going to trigger accurately. And that's one way that we had to adjust the gain structure because of a plugin. Next up, let's take a look at a maybe the bass, and we'll look at a compressor. Let's pick a compressor, any compressor. My favorite lately has been this Novatron. If I've got this Novatron here, um. Let me say this first. My man Joey Fernandez and I were hanging out the other night, and uh, we've got an awesome video coming your way showing you a, a sick system. Those of you who share your mix sessions with clients are really going to appreciate uh, some software we're going to share with you that we found. Uh, I've used it before, but they updated it. Whew. If all continues to work the way we've been testing it, nice cast and sharing streaming with clients is going to be a thing of the past. You guys are going to love us for it. We've, it's pretty incredible the way this thing is working. So we'll share that soon. But uh, we were talking, we were hanging out, and we went through, must have been 20 or 30 different plug-in manuals to see, do plug-in companies list what that sweet spot is for their plugins? Some do. If you go to Waves, there's a couple of Wave, Waves plugins. We looked at the Sheps, Sheps 73, um, the Sheps, um, uh, the Omni Channel. Several of them do say between a minus 12 to minus 18. Uh, I can't remember if it was peak or not, but um, that that would be important. However, most don't. Not every plugin does. Waves, ton of theirs, don't have any kind of information on what that sweet spot is. So while there is a sweet spot, I keep doing that as if the, there's not, but there is, um, the, the way to find out is just to, to send signal into it and see how it reacts. Something like Novatron, they do just explain in the manual that, hey, um, if I remember correctly, attack, compress, and release straight up and down. Um, and then that reducing one to three dB of reduction, I believe is the starting point. Don't quote me on that. It's more about the principle that yes, some plugins give you a sweet spot, read the manual, check it out as a bug flies on my wrist. Um, and so check in the manual. And then if it doesn't state in the manual, what you want to do is you want to pull that plugin up and you want to increase signal until you see a little bit of action happening. And then you can back off the output like we described with trigger to make sure you don't uh, ruin your balance there that you had on the rough mix. So let's solo the bass and let's say straight up and down, how's this looking? So we're getting some love here. So we could increase the input a little bit if we wanted. Obviously that made it louder. Now I should have looked at the manual before talking about this. I believe when you see some action happening, that's a sweet spot for this one, but don't quote me on that. Go check out the manual yourself. But now listen to the difference. Way louder. Throw that in the track, it's gonna completely throw off our balance. It's too loud. So we wanna make sure we pull that back on the output. But since we've compressed it, we may have reduced the, the transient, but lifted up the, the lower lying stuff, the sustain in it, increase the sustain, uh, so keep that in mind when you do it. It's not a perfect science. You don't have to sit here and get a meter out or anything. Just kind of make sure that if you drive signal, you pull back the output and you check it. Uh, so as far as compressor plugins, EQ plugins go, double check your gain staging with your input and your output. That's going to be a lot more important than worrying, um, am I sending too little or too much? Check the manual, give it a good look, but the whole sweet spot thing, don't overthink it. 
just look at what the plugin's calling for. If it doesn't say anything, just put a good signal in and you're probably going to be okay. All right, so I'd love to hear what you think. If you enjoyed this, went a little bit longer than I thought, but a lot of information to get in there. I hope this helps you guys streamline your workflow when it comes to rough mix, gain staging, a little bit of uh, maybe a little more understanding about how that's working, how you may have to manipulate it for certain plugins. But at the end of the day, try not to overthink it. Think creatively. Think, uh, get this education under your belt so that you don't have to think about it as much and just kind of get to the the creative process so uh, if you enjoyed this i'd love to have you check out the mix academy don't forget right now we've got a dollar trial get you in you get all of the bonuses even with the dollar trial we've got mixing with delay mixing with reverb mixing with special effects are now all included with the membership they are no longer just uh, standalone courses they're included for free technically as a bonus with your membership And uh, you can start that at themixacademy.com. Tons of files in there. We've got the whole back catalog. There's more than you can get to in 14 days. So I dare you to try, but I would love to have you check it out. would love to see you join the community, themixacademy.com. Don't forget to post comments, questions, thoughts, concerns, anything at all. I'm back working hard to get you guys caught up. If you've emailed me to get you a response, if there's something outstanding to get that to you delivered into your hands. I hope you're doing amazing. I hope you enjoyed this, and we'll see you in the next one.